quick here, it'll take you less than two minutes to be able to to donate to their adoption. um the response has just been tremendous. i've seen through all the news just yeah, give them a story tell the story that they need and just give them a little act or something that's incredible. a number of them come to mind for me but the best stories in my view are the ones where technology assists in the human relationship and doesn't replace it and and we can talk about that later but a couple that come to my mind is part of my church and my denomination is we're we're very global. i mean we're just all over the world so to have immediate access to missionaries overseas and some of them who are strict they just want to hear good bible teaching in english and they're immersed in another culture with the internet they they can get that immediately and it's it's helpful. i have a friend in ohio who was trying to set up a trip to cambodia and he contacted me in chicago to ask who i knew in cambodia and i connected him with my friends in cambodia and all this happened and literally within thirty minutes he had a place to stay in cambodia and that's an obvious technological piece of communication but that wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago another one that comes to mind is um i had a guy similar to this other story not quite as dramatic about the attempted suicide but he was in our town. He had no connection to the church whatsoever. He somehow find me on the, found me on the internet, called me up, and was in tears on the phone because he wanted to know if his dog was going to go to heaven. <laughs> and this is not a child. This was an adult man who was just distraught because his dog was really... And I had to walk him through <coughs> the strangest pastoral counseling I've ever done, except for the woman with split personalities. And, <laughs> and I had to walk him through the decision to put his dog down on the phone. And because that was his first introduction to Christian ethics. And he found me on the internet. He had no idea who I was. So just bizarre things like that happen. And But they always assist the human relationship. They don't replace it. And, and that's the key for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I resonate with that so completely. I mean, if, if you guys have ever visited the site on thecity.org, you know that in the upper left-hand corner, I talked about real, not virtual community for Jesus' fame. So if you don't have a story as a result of real community, then you miss the boat, right? I mean. So I, one of the things that I was really excited about very early on in the release of the city was uh, our downtown campus, right in the middle of uh, urban Seattle. Um, and uh, they wanted to show the city that they loved them. Uh, you know, we as Christians, it seems like sometimes we gotta, we gotta uh, plan around the things that the gospel clears, clearly calls us to do. And so they're like, all right, let's see what we can do to, to reach our neighborhood. And so they very quickly organized an event, got 200 people to come together to do something simple like you know, painting over graffiti in the city. Um, it was the single largest volunteer effort the city of Seattle had ever seen. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but the city of Seattle is not um, pro-church, right? They really don't like us there. And so to have technology enable something to actually happen in the real world where people could see the cross of Christ lifted up um, and start those conversations, start those interfacing between the church and, in this case, the, the local government. Um, that was awesome. Um, but I still like your story, man. If that's not a, an encouragement to understand what SEO is and search yeah. engine optimization, that, uh, I think nothing will to convince you otherwise. So. Sure. And uh, Seattle's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the least church city in America. Or I think has it's it the second least since, church. Since yeah. you guys have been there. Probably. Yeah, I think it's the second least church in America. There's more dogs than Christians there. Uh, so yeah, they they don't really know who Jesus is. Wow. Okay, well, um, what what kind of tools do you guys think that uh, would help make a church run e- either easier or more effective, or just really assist just the local church in a practical way? I'm gonna get to really really basic stuff here. Um, email newsletters. I sh- I'm sure that most of you probably use them, but. Um, if done the right way, and there's definitely a right way and a, and a wrong way, they, they've been very effective. And we've kind of, that's something we're, we track, you tracking that kind of stuff is so essential too. It's not just <coughs> sending a bunch of emails out, you know, through Outlook and leaving everyone in the two fields so you can see everyone's email address and that kind of stuff. But, you know, there are some very inexpensive services that will, will help you manage that and track it to see if they're being effective. Um, we've started using quick little videos, just, I mean, simple, make it on your computer, quick, you know, little video camera. Of you know our pastor just you know encouraging people to come to a different service because one is one is too full or volunteer just something 
visual into it too. Um, that's been a really effective way. And I know it's, again, super basic. It's been around for a while, but it's been very effective within our church. <coughs> Just something as easy as that. The, you know, like the same kind of concept, blogging. I remember when I, I used to live in South Chicago land area, but there was a very small church. I was going to a big church. The pastor left. I, I loved what he was doing. He started a small church, the classic. We met in a movie theater. I'm sure you guys have all heard stories like that. But he blogged all the time throughout the week, and there was this super weird connection that when you showed up on Sunday, it was like, oh, I already know what's on his mind. Administration standpoint, base camp, um, can't say enough. And if you could read their blog, and some people will need to censor it, but um, huge fan of the way they think about doing things, less is more, and using technology just to enable real life stuff. I'm a huge fan of 37 Signals. So. To, to build off of that, I'm not techie at all. I am not techie. I, I just. I fell off that thing a long time ago. Everyone else is still on it. I just don't get it. But I have friends who can do it, which is, it's all about the body of Christ, right? I can't do it. But I hate committees. I hate meetings. I hate committees. And at, before I was on staff at a church, I had a lot of hair. And <laughs> the committees is what they, that drove me mad. I just couldn't handle anymore. And I'm sure you've been there. But something like Basecamp or other tools like that allow you to get a lot of work done without having the meet in committees. I mean, you can get projects done. There's a base where you can go to and see what people are working on, communicate with each other without having to wait till next month when you have another meeting. And churches are notoriously slow at getting things done. And partly it's because of arranging schedules and getting all in the same room. And, you know, we have to do the obligatory prayer requests, which take half the time. And that sounds really callous, but sometimes things just need to get done. And Tools on the internet can help you do that in a, in a much more efficient way. And very affordably, too. It doesn't right. need to be enterprise software. No. I mean, you can do some amazing stuff with twenty nine ninety five a month with Basecamp. Or 24 is the highest market. And it's such a, I mean, it's a wide open question, yeah. like what tools are useful. Um, my advice on that is really know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, for some, blogging is going to be a really effective means of getting the word out to build the corporate memory of, of who you are and what you're about and what you're what you're going to continue to do in the future. But it's not going to work for everybody. Um, and so one of the things that I would really advise is know what you're about um, and then identify those tools that are going to help you do whatever that is. So if you're really about community, then find tools that are really about community. If you really want to get your message out, then Understand SEO, understand how to stream video and all those sorts of things that are going to be apropos to what you want to accomplish. Um, but definitely don't just do something because someone else is. You've got to try it. You've got to look for the outcomes. Um, I'm very pragmatic. That's the, the uh, development style that 37 Signals yeah. uses. Um, and that is all about the results of the, the idea process. Um, so understand what you're looking for and get the results that you need. And that's I couldn't agree more. There's nothing worse than the church that decides to start using Twitter and it just doesn't feel genuine. It doesn't right. feel real. So. And it's, it's, don't be afraid to ask the people in your church, too. We did, yeah. um, the church I was on staff, with, we did kind of a, a focus group sort of thing um, informally through the adult, adult Bible fellowships. And we just had surveys and just said, you know, how do you get your news? How do you read your news? How do you, how do you communicate with your family and your friends online? And we were able to learn a lot because we, we were under the perception that they did other things than what they actually did. And so we were able to kind of tweak what we were using and how we were communicating to really fit the, and it. And we would have never known any other way but then to ask. You know, we can assume, but we all know what that means. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you guys have, have read this uh, article in the UK. They just did a study. Uh, average teenager spends 31 hours online. Um, Some of it. I think it's a 31 hours long, two hours looking at pornography on the average. Um, what are they doing? I mean, what are they looking at? They're, I think a lot of it is they're, they're online looking at videos, whether it's good videos or bad videos or church videos or non-church videos. Um, I really think that it's important to just, I was I've talked to a couple of you guys out there that, you know, do things that are going to be sticky. Do things that are going to give people a reason to, like, come to your side. I mean, if, if you don't have something that gives them a reason to spend time there, um, they're not going to come. They're not going to. They're not going to learn. They're not going to listen. I think you know one great <coughs> example uh, is Mars Hill. I mean, they not only have like a podcast of everything they do, but pretty much any time they do a series, like a, a teaching series, they have like this crazy animation video, or they 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 just do things that that grab your attention 
and then give you a medium that you're going to want to stick around and spend time learning. So I'd encourage you guys, you know, just keep, like they said, keep it basic, keep it simple, but use what people are already doing. You know, don't try to create the wheel, the wheel again. It's just it's a waste of time. Um, blogging. We're all talking about blogging, and I think most people on, on here have a blog except one. Uh, do I really need to blog or even read other blogs, and which ones? Well, the, yeah, I'll jump in here on the first one. You have to read other blogs. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, in my Google Reader, I think I'm subscribed to probably 150 uh, different feeds right now, and I'm constantly calling those. Um, so I, for the newer generation, print is too slow in a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I find out all my news first online, then it's almost as if the, the, the newspaper, the local newspaper, is way too late by the time it comes out the next morning. So it is a very current, very contemporary way of finding out what is happening and, 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 and what's interesting. Um, and I, I go back on, on the blogging thing. I've, I've blogged before. I'm the guy that doesn't have a blog, sort of. Um, and it's all about understanding you know, what, is the, what is the purpose of your presence online? What is the purpose of having your message out there? Um, and so for me, I don't really talk about myself as much as I talk about ideas. And so I blog on, on the city.org. There's, there's my blog. Um, whereas if you're a leader in the church, absolutely blog about yourself so that they know who you are, so they can understand your message. Um, I think it's an incredibly invaluable way, again, of promoting the corporate memory of what you are about. Um, just like any small group in the church needs to have memory, so too people need to understand their leaders so they can, uh, again, respect that. I would completely agree. There's, there's nothing more current. There's nothing more sometimes unvetted. It doesn't, hasn't gone through the publishing process, so it's immediate response. On There may be a news article, and then someone wants to respond with their thoughts on that. Whether it's secular or it's Christian or whatever it might be, it's, um, I mean, yeah, it's like how can you live without it? This is, <laughs> yes, our blog is supposed to look like that. It's a blog I started. It has nothing to do with uh, um, the faith at all. But um, this is with my friend, my friend Chuck from uh, No Pattern, who's a designer. Um, he's done some work with Relevant Magazine and a bunch of other people, myself, and then Virgil Abloh, who is uh, Kanye West's creative director. Um, we started this site like four years ago. This is just an example of the same idea of blogging about ideas um, and using it as a platform. When a church can, like you were saying earlier, don't blog if you don't feel like it's not. I, I couldn't agree more with that. If it's not what you what you what your people want, or it's not going to land on them. But if it is, if it is something that works, it's what a great way to one inexpensively because cost is usually concerned, and two. Get your thoughts on paper so that they're referenceable, they're commentable. They're, we've turned comments off on us, but um, <laughs> but as a way, it's just a great way. I hate to use the term in between Sundays, but why not? I mean, it's it's just so easy, <laughs> and it's a great way to give yourself a voice, a personality, and extend your brand. I don't think everyone should blog. Um, I think if you want to write, you should. It's a great way to practice discipline. Um, mm -hmm. I found that that I do write more consistently and put more thought into it when I know that it's going to be in a more public forum like a blog. Um, but for some people, like my husband, for example, he is not a blogger. Um, he's very laid back, very cool. He understands technology. He's very much into media. He reads blogs. Um, he keeps track of stuff. But for him, he just journals, you know, and, and that's kind of, he has to examine his purpose, you know. Does he have a message to, to tell the world? Absolutely, he does. But blogging for him is not the platform to do it. And he's gone through a season where he's done it, and he realized it wasn't his thing. So it's kind of, you, you have to examine what's your motivation behind that. And I know that that's a, a question I consistently ask myself is, am I doing it because I want to be popular yeah. or to do the cool thing or to get a lot of attention or to do controver you know, controversial stuff? And, and it's examining the heart behind it, too, I think is really, really important. Because if you just want to blog because, you know, some bloggers can get famous or get book deals or whatever, it's, it's probably not the right thing to do at the moment. Um, but definitely read, because there are so many interesting and smart people out there. Absolutely. Uh, well, Anna and Sky, you guys mentioned something about um, between church and, and doing things between church. And then you also mentioned to me earlier about Carlos Whitaker and what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, yeah. about that off, I think it's off the blog? Off the blog. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Whitaker is another blogger. Um, his, his website is ragamuffinsoul.com. 
and then John Acuff is stuffchristianslife.net. Um, both very high traffic blogs. Um, I'm kind of like the little sister of them both, I guess, if you wanted to, uh, to put a title on it. But what we've seen in, within our blogs is really great community form. Um, sorry, there's who knows what you're going to see on these blogs, because we can be a little irreverent at times, so I apologize. Um, but uh, we've seen really, really good community happen within our blogs. You know, talking about things that people don't like to talk about. You know, struggles with depression or, or porn addictions or um, even struggles within working in the church. And people have been able to read this and identify with it and say, you know, I feel the same way. And this community develops, which has been great. And <coughs> now we're kind of challenging um, the thought of it of, okay, we, we've seen this happen on blogs and online. Let's take it offline. Let's actually make these gatherings. You know, Twitter meetups and blogger meetups are very popular now. Um, so we're we're doing it. C- Catalyst is kind of kind of helping us out with that. And after the Catalyst One Day in Atlanta um, on the 26th is our first one. We're meeting um, at, at uh, Buckhead Christian Church. I think is the name of the church. And we're going to be talking about the same things we talk about on our blog, and giving people a chance in person to respond and for just that that conversation to continue offline as well, because we, we see the value in the community online, and we think it could just be so much you know more enhanced in person. So I think offtheblogs.com, I think is the website for uh, for that, that event. And we're going to see if, how it goes and maybe do it in some more cities, but um, it's really just about stripping off the, the personality. Because you see a blogger, and you see that they have a personality, and you associate, you know, Carlos is, is just very energetic and just says whatever and, and is outgoing and, and funny. Um, but there's these, these sides that you don't see unless you actually get to, to meet them in person. And so it's just taking all the agendas, all the personal, all, all of this stuff, because I may share something very personal on my blog, but you're still just getting a small percent of who I am. Whereas if we had a conversation, it'd be different. And it's just, it's the holistic form of community on and offline. So it's kind of the, the off the blogs. I can, uh, let me back up to the previous question, and I'll be the contrarian. <coughs> Do you have to blog? No. Do you have to read blogs? No, you don't. Um, it might be beneficial in certain places and certain ministries to do that, but somehow the world has existed for all these years without yeah. blogs. Okay. And the gospel has advanced without blogs, and the church community has loved one another and done all sorts of wonderful things without blogs. It will happen without blogs. Um, the reason I blog primarily, uh, one blog is for work, so I have to. The other blog, my personal blog, is because I'm a writer. I write. I write articles. I write books. I do. That's what I do. And so, it is a good discipline for me to begin to uh, germinate ideas and process and get some feedback. But as a pastor, I have to tell you, I didn't start a personal blog until this past year. And one of the big reasons I didn't, well, two big reasons is one. I have a wife and three children, and I don't need a mistress of a blog on the side that takes all my time and attention away. And that was one hesitation. The other big hesitation was, um, frankly, I'm scared about what people in my church are going to do when they find out what's going on inside my head. And if I blog about that all the time, I know it's I, I'm. I don't want to say I, I'm, I don't want to be authentic, but as a pastor, you are um, you are putting yourself out there. And sometimes there are questions in your mind or theology you're wrestling with or good heavens, if they knew some of my political ideas, they would kill me. Um, you know, th- that kind of stuff, I don't want to put it out there because I know it would get in the way of my proclamation of the gospel. doesn't mean I'm ashamed of something that's in my mind, but I don't want to put all that in front of my people because it's going to distract them from what I really want to be telling them. So I have to be very mindful and careful, and my wife helps me boldly uh, about what I put on my blog. Because you've got to, you, you are not just a blogger if you are a pastor. You are something else. And here's the other thing I, I think you should be thinking about. Uh, if you're going to blog, you've got to be clear about why. And what I see in a lot of people who are blogging is, um, there's that old adage that one of the reasons we get married is because we want a witness to our life. We want a partner that can watch our life because it's only when our life is seen by someone else that it feels like it has meaning and significance. I think there's a lot of people who blog because they want to believe that their life matters, that someone else is going to watch their life and read what's happening, and therefore it matters. And I think as a believer, we have to be secure in the fact that my life matters, whether I blog or not, or whether I'm married or not, because God watches my life, and every life matters. So if you're trying to blog to get some level of attention or affirmation or I matter, uh, you got other issues. 
frankly. And it's not going to be solved by blogging. What you need is genuine community, both with God and with his people. So if you can get those issues out of the way, and you can think about a more pragmatic reason to engage in blogging, more power to you. But you got to do that examination work first. And just to add real quick to what you just said about that, um, something I've been wrestling with is that. You know, is, is I've always struggled, just to be honest, with, with getting affirmation from people. Um, I didn't get a lot of it growing up, so that's naturally where I go. Um, and with the blog, when people comment and tell you how wonderful you are all the time, it's really easy just to get, I mean, tied up on that. They don't, I'm not really wonderful, so it's kind of funny. But um, so for, I've decided, at first I was just going to turn off comments because I thought the comments were either, if they were good, they would feed me. If they were bad, they would break me. So just turn off comments. I'm like, no, it's more than that. And so for, I've never given anything up for Lent ever. And I think for, for Lent, part of, part of that, that season for me is I'm going to stop blogging for six weeks, which is an incredibly scary thing to do when you've been doing it for, you know, unofficially five years, but, but officially with, with flower dust for, for three years. Um, to just shut it down for you know, almost six weeks is it's kind of a thing, but I, I think I need, I've learned my motivation right now stinks, and, and I've got to kind of refocus that. So there's definitely a lot of truth to the motivation there, too. <coughs> Stuff. Um, next question, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, everybody that's here. Um, should I use, if I'm a pastor in a church and I'm trying to reach out uh, to an online community, should I use Facebook or MySpace, or should I use the tools that are specifically designed for churches? And I think the answer would be is. yes. Um, that's how I'd like to, to start off the conversation. Facebook has 150 million people on it. That's an unbelievable audience. Um, now, Facebook is also probably the most mixed message environment you're ever going to be in. Um, you can go in there and you're going to see probably 100 different messages just on your home page. So as a church, we absolutely have to think strategically about how we do engage <coughs> with Facebook. Um, I'd recommend it. Probably the vast majority of your people are using it if that 150 million number is true. But again, understand what the purpose of the site is. Um, if you're going there looking for community, you're probably not going to find it. You're going to find a great distribution channel. You're going to find another opportunity to say, we've got this event coming up, or you've got another opportunity to have another front door uh, for your church provided by Facebook. Um, but it's not the whole thing. I, yeah, I would agree. I think Facebook is, you said distribution model. It's almost like its own internet now. It's like there's the internet, and then there's like Facebook. It's like you can entirely exist on Facebook and get informed on what's going on. But I think it's a great distribution channel. It doesn't really, it, when you were, so what, are these, what are these kids doing for 31 hours online every week? A lot of it's Facebook. I think a lot of it's them finding themselves online rather than in the real world. And a lot of that happens on social networks and stuff like that. I mean, anybody remembers Live Journal? Sorry, a while back, that was quite an interesting space of people exploring who they were and finding other things. But I, I think Facebook is a great thing to use to go to an ultimate goal. I think you've made the comment, I know it's on your tagline, and we've had the tagline, it's 10% double clicking, 90% real life. The web is just an enabler. Please Absolutely. go outside and do stuff. <laughs> you know, like whether it's serving or it's creating relationships or whatever it is, use the web as a conduit, not as the end destination. So. Absolutely, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to share the story about walking past a coffee shop in my neighborhood. And uh, you know, Seattle's a pretty tech heavy environment. Walking by, and the coffee shop is dead quiet. And it's just white headphones. And everybody's got their white headphones <laughs> on, and they're on Facebook. Now, what kind of a disservice is technology doing to creating community there? These are all people on the same website that if the technology had the heart of the church, it would be connecting them together. But instead, they're all in these little isolated bubbles bowling alone. Um, and that, unfortunately, that's there's, a whole, there's a whole new generation that is thinking that that's real community that their community is validated in the number of friends they have on MySpace or Facebook or whatnot. Um, and it's a great disservice as a church if we validate that as, yep, you, you are in the vital community now. Um, obviously, that was my heart and my, my desire and passion behind building the city, was making technology just be a conduit to the real world, making yeah. things happen in real life. I, um, I walk past that coffee shop every day, and I'm just praying like, Lord, change this. Make it so a community actually flourishes through technology. Instead, we've got so many examples where technology is just virtual world only. And I'm sure, you know, with the city, um, by the way, I'm a fan of that stuff, but um, 
like when we were creating the common, like I'm from the Facebook generation. Like I do everything online, right? Not really. In fact, when we were doing it, some of the things we, that tagline I just said, and everything else is, this is to go out and get your hands dirty. Yeah. Please join projects and meet people in real life. I don't want you spending time on my site. So like when my Google Analytics tell me people are spending more and more time on my site, it's almost like, oh, it's like how do I going, fix that? Absolutely. <laughs> how do I get you to be on there as quick as possible and hopefully get off and do something in real life? And it's funny to look at those. I'm a big kind of analyzer, tracker kind of person. Yeah. I love measuring things. And I don't remember the website name, but there's something that you can go to and put in your Twitter profile, and it'll tell you it's how, your how many um, <coughs> like how many days you've spent on Twitter, because they say like an average oh. of 30 <laughs> seconds per tweet is what you spend, you know, formulating your, your tweet. Um, times however many <laughs> number of tweets you have. <laughs> And, like now we're into Twitter. It oh was boy. it was it was scary because I, I Twitter a lot. I've been doing it since it came out, so it's been a couple of years. Um, so I'm trying to justify a little bit there, but um, it's like how many tweets do I have? Like 50, 400 or something ridiculous. It was almost two days yeah. of Twittering over the 5, last. Fifty-five hundred. So whatever that times thirty seconds is, and that's just tweeting. It's not reading or responding to them. Um, it. It was almost two days of my life spent making 140 character sentences to, to communicate to 2,600 people I don't know. <laughs> and I kind of, that really put it into perspective that, wow, that's a kind mm -hmm. of, I need to get my hands dirty a little bit more, you know, and, and right Twitter a little bit less. So, um, this my day if you want to know what I've been doing. <laughs> I've only done it twice today. You lost your so, phone. Did you find your phone again? Yeah, my friend found my phone and posted it. He didn't find it. So we kept looking for it That's and he laughed fun. at us. It was great. I've, I've done that. <laughs> I'll, um, what, just one more. It's kind of a follow up. You guys are saying spend time off the site and, and that's what you want. So these pastors that are here, they're thinking, yeah, I agree with you 100%. How do I communicate that? How do I verbalize that? How do I make that something that, even though I'm, I'm allowing my community to access all of these things so they can have the information and, and, and be encouraged and be edified, but then at the same time, how do I help them leverage their time so that they're not spending all of their time in that, in that, in that bubble? Sorry. I think you could. I think you could tell them and you can explain to them that that's what you can do, but ultimately any of the tools that you're using or designing or building, engineer them to encourage you to only be on there for the time needed. I'm not saying social networking is bad. I mean, I waste time on Facebook too. But if your goal is to get people in, a, in, a, in action and go do something, design yeah. your tool to do that. Because you can tell people all you want, but design a tool to almost force them to do that. <laughs> I think uh, a number of things come to mind, but I, I, I think the church, the gathered church, the people together, in a way needs to be an oasis in our culture, away from, there's so much technology, there's so much information being thrown at us, there's so much, so many flickering pixels to use Shane Hips thing. I think the church really needs to be an oasis where we stand firm that the incarnation matters, that the gospel incarnate matters, that people in the flesh matter. And we got to give them that oasis experience. And for that reason, I'm sort of a Luddite in, in, in saying on Sunday morning, I don't want technology in the worship. We have a screen, a big, huge screen, that we project lyrics on when we're singing. But other than that, I just don't. I mean, a book is technology. So I, mean, you're, you're, how I, I, I don't care if our church is contemporary and cutting edge and modern. Because we're never going to be as contemporary and cutting edge and cool as the culture. It's just never going to happen. I'm going to quit trying. I want to give people an oasis. That's number one. Number two, and I love the fact that you, you, you already shared this, but um, we, pra we try to practice corporate spiritual disciplines in the church where we don't just do them individually, but we try to do disciplines together as a community, or at least we're aware that as a community we're doing them in our separate lives. And one of them that we've been enforcing more during Lent, as well as other times, is a media fast. <coughs> Uh, you know, the traditional fast of fasting from food is great. I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but one of the reasons why it was so relevant thousands of years ago was think about the amount of time people had to spend every day just in the preparation of food. They didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have supermarket, and huge amounts of time went into preparing food. So if you fasted, not only were you going through the physical discipline of feeling hungry and using that to commune with God, you were freeing up enormous amounts of your time to pray every day because you didn't have to worry about making food. 
Well, we don't spend that much time making food in our culture anymore because McDonald's does that for us and the grocery store does it for us. We spend all of our time in front of screens. So we've told our people is pick a day every week like Sunday and fast from media. Turn off the iPod, turn off the computer, turn off the television, and imagine what's going to happen to your family when you're not looking at screens all the time or during Lent. I did it yeah, a couple weeks before Christmas, I think between uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's, give or take. Um, and it was honestly, it was the first time I had unplugged. I didn't Twitter, mm-hmm. Facebook, blog, nothing. Um, and it was unreal. At first, it was kind of weird because you do go through that withdrawal kind of sense because it is an addiction. I mean, you there's definitely something chemical going on there. So we, my husband and I traveled to, to see his parents for Christmas, and we saw these nuns at a Starbucks in, in, in a, the airport. I'm like, this is amazing, twit pick, like nuns at a Starbucks. I can't do that. Oh, what am I going to do? i got to talk about this, you know? But after a few days, you know, that kind of like, I have to share everything everywhere with the world, it, it went away, and it was so amazing. I think that's what, I try and do that every week, uh, to have some sort of kind of a, a fast, because, and I schedule it in on my calendar, so it's nothing, you know, and, and I watch the news on TV, that's that's pretty much it on this week, it's book time, and mm-hmm. my gosh, it, it's hard at first, but if you can build it, and even every other week, like, you'll start seeing the value in that. And it's just, it becomes an amazing thing. I, I was in Ohio back in September visiting some friends, and I came, there was a huge windstorm in Ohio. Everybody's from Cincinnati or that area. There was a massive windstorm, and power was knocked out throughout southwestern <coughs> Ohio was, for like a, almost a week. And I was talking to people afterwards, and, and everyone said that they really were sad when the power came back on. Because they said, for the first time, we met our neighbors. For the first time, our kids were playing outside the way we used to play when we were kids. But you know, they didn't have video games weren't working, and they couldn't. Eventually, the cell phones died because they couldn't recharge them. And <coughs> it was it, quiet. It was quiet, and so we, we re-engaged in community, and we learned to talk to one another. And you know, I think we need to build that discipline into our lives and value that in our churches, and that needs to be led by the leadership. Absolutely. We need to show them and model that. Technology is great. I'm not going to say don't use it, but we need to teach people moderation in the appropriate place for it, which they're not going to be learning from our culture. So our culture says 24-7, and um, ministry is 24-7, needs are 24-7, you know, there's no rest from that, but um, I think a lot of churches try and, and give that 24-7 experience, and that is, I mean, <coughs> you, you are modeling that 24-7 is okay, and we're Sabbath in that, I'm sorry, but where is Sabbath in that? You know, and, and you're modeling that for your congregations and for people because it is such an online world that do just Google whatever and, and, and find whatever. And, and if we're just, you're, you're leading by example. And I think it's so important to build those, the Sabbath. I mean, it's a media Sabbath in a way, just to reconnect um, with leaders and the people around you. Back in uh, October of this last year, I mean, I'm sort of just like you, Benjamin, I measure everything that that's going on, even, trying to, even make if you things, don't want to make things better. And one of the things that I measured uh, with the city was we're seeing 75% of people logging in daily for less than 10 minutes. Um, and I just about got up and jumped and shouted around the room. I was so happy. Um, because think of both of those numbers. And, and this is, how does, uh, technology so often is an absorber, like it absorbs the lives of various ministers and Facebook. I mean, they're just, Constantly playing games, or just you know they've lost their flock in favor of their virtual flock, whatever that means. Um, and to see 75% daily people coming back, man, that's that's awesome. People are actually seeing that there's something there. But for less than 10 minutes, that was awesome. They're not wasting time. They're involved in life. And I think those are the kinds of things that, as we look at how technology shapes life, we have to realize, go in with eyes open, that the decisions you make in technology will influence how people spend their time. It's, you know, it's if just you have a tool, it's ab- another thing. Absolutely, it's another thing that can that can take you in, um, and you you've got to be mindful of that because it is so easy, especially in the current culture, to become media drenched. Um, and yeah, Facebook is a great example of that. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things. I, we were talking about blogging and becoming popular and the feeling around that. It, I think every human response to that in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. People start following your blog, and you get a following, and people comment and email you. And yeah, that doesn't really produce a whole lot. I mean, yeah. it, it'd be the same as a pastor who kind of, I think, maybe, you know, pounds his chest and says, you know, you guys all love me. I thank you for telling me I'm so good. You know, there's really no difference. That's not good, right? There's no difference in that in blogging on a small scale, I guess. 
think this is turning to the scary from technology panel. <laughs> yeah, <Okay, right. laughs> Don't use this. this. There won't be a panel next year. <laughs> we'll have therapy sessions available at the back <laughs> for all of the basic addicts. There you go. We're all going to Twitter about this afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> I don't Twitter. I just I don't know I'm on this panel at this point. I'm <laughs> sort of sticking the mud here. So, uh, we want to open it up now for uh, any questions that you guys have about technology in the church, how to use it. Not all at the same time again. Thanks. Go ahead. Sky, right? Yeah. Um, I just really resonated with what you said about being hesitant about starting a blog. I, I mean, I've, I have not done that, and I keep almost starting and I wonder I just wonder what your experience has been since you started and the positives and negatives. Um, overall it's been good. I I don't blog every day. I mean the post that's up there on the homepage was from Monday, I guess. I've been too busy this week at NPC. I just I don't have time to do that. Um, so I, I'm part of the reason I started that blog was because I'm getting it's partly a marketing part. I mean, I'm getting more invitations to speak. I'm getting around, and it's nice to have a home base for schedule and sort of that, and people know what I'm doing. And so, but it's not. I I don't. Days go by, I don't even think about it. I really don't. I just oh, I forgot I have a blog. I gotta clear some comments or something. But um, and usually the things I write are I try to hit as many birds with one stone as possible. So if I write something for Leadership Journal or Audubon.com or one of those. Other, I'll post it on my blog as well because they let me do that. Or, um, though it's, it hasn't been too bad. It's been, and, and frankly, it, I, I, I don't know how to do that. I didn't build that. I have a friend who's really good at that sort of stuff, and he built it for me. And he said, here's what you do. You plug this, you do that. And I'm like, great. Um, so that's been the main role of it. But it hasn't taken I – don't, I, I think if my wife were up here, she wouldn't tell you that it's been a burden on our life or something. Um, What's harder is, uh, I got an iPhone recently. It was a gift. It was a chocolate-covered turd <laughs> to use Rob Bell's. Uh, I mean, I, I like it, but I realize I am always in touch now. And, it, and that's kind of a, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. So we'll see how that goes. You have to ask me a lot. So, uh, one quick comment that um, kind of resonates. There's a book out there called Distracted. And the, the teen online for 31 hours a week or whatever it is, um, they, you lose interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the way that we've trained our young people is that um, is text messaging because email is old school and answering the phone is old school. So the only way you can get their attention is usually by video or text. So you have to go meet them at that level. And so how do you get the messaging through? The book actually paints a very sad commentary that we're all going to be on Prozac and need counseling or pastors because, I mean, <laughs> you have to be able to communicate except for uh, being able to do 140 character strings. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one sad thing. On the other thing is that uh, um, there's a pastor, <coughs> and, uh, Brad Powell wrote Sacred Cow Tipping, and he actually asks if your church is healthy. Mm -hmm. And the problem is many of the churches are not healthy financially, spiritually, mm -hmm. lovingly, and I do think you do have to have a mix of technology um, because that's how so society actually finds you today. So if you might want, the question becomes is that finding that right mix. Because yeah. there's a whole lot of bad blogs out there and a whole lot of junk, but there are some nuggets. And it's really a trick to find those nuggets. And yeah. each church, and I'd like you to speak to it, is that how do you become a healthy church and what is the right mix of technology? And it's a hard question to answer. But you have to use it somehow because uh, that's the next generation. And you can't escape. So you're not going to have to. So there was a question in there somewhere about building I would just try to side with Gabe Lyons on this one and say be culture creators to the best of your ability and then go back to your point, which is only do things or was it your point? Only do things targeted to what you think you need to know. Don't Twitter because you should, don't blog because you should, don't make video. Just create the culture that you feel like that pastor, whoever's leading your church and the team who's there, you hope it's in their hearts that they had a vision and a reason for why they're on stage or why people should listen to them. And ultimately, at their heart, if they feel like Twitter's the one way that they're going to, that sounds weird just saying it, Twitter's the way that they're going to do that, that's great. If they feel like completely turning off technology, and I love your concept of being like, I have a family and I don't need another distraction. I also love the concept of forgetting about your blog. That's like the best way to blog is forget about it and only blog when you feel like it. Don't blog because you have a blog. Anyway, I, I think it's, I don't know if that was a good answer, but just create the culture that you feel 
you might miss those people that feel like they need Vimeo videos of, of every sermon. Maybe another church will grab them, I hope. And not to like over spiritualize it, but I think you just really have to ask for guidance and that kind of stuff. Actually, yeah, that's I mean, that trust the Holy Spirit. I mean, what happened to that? Um, that not to over simplify or like to over spiritualize it, but um, but really, if, if you know you've been placed in a certain community in a certain location in a certain time, you know, it's all been very providentially set. And if you just listen, you know, to those nudges and those whispers, you know, you'll be guided. I think directly, you know, in, in the right way, if, and if you're obedient to that. I mean, God will bless you for it. And if you're not using technology, um, you know, I, I, there are some churches I know that really don't use a lot of what we would consider technology today. They don't use a lot of videos in their services or, or um, you know, all the multimedia stuff. The pastors don't blog. And they are some, because it seems like they're out there more, um, they're, they're more of that um, just Christ on earth kind of stuff. Um, and it seems that their, their growth, you know, maybe not be numerically as much, but the impact that they're having on lives in their community is. And I think that's just because they're uniquely called to do that. <coughs> Whereas some churches are uniquely called to be hyper technical, I think, you know, and, and they're reaching a completely different generation. So it does, it takes a, a diverse mix of everything. Yeah, I'd go back to what Scott said at the beginning, that this is, a, it's an issue of the body of Christ, right? Um, there, are, there are guys like me that wake up every day thinking about code. That's how I work. Um, mm-hmm. And I know very clearly that this is how God has made me. This is who he's called me to be. I'm a technologist. That's what I am. In eight years at Amazon, my whole life I've been writing code. This is how I worship. Um, And I would say the same thing. Like, man, the guys that get up on stage to play musical instruments, I would hope that people approaching technology do so with the same level of gifting, the same level of calling and purpose, that that is what they are to be about. Because if not, man, it's going to be like me trying to play guitar. Not you don't want to see that, not right? Just cause, not just because I should, because it's technology, but because I love it. Because I Absolutely. It. Uh, I think we are, uh, we don't have a good history as evangelicals, if that's what you consider yourself, of modeling wisdom and moderation. We tend to say all or nothing. I mean, when new technologies came along, like movies, we said no. <laughs> no movies. Um, now we've got new ones. Right, right, now we have <laughs> But we, we, we've not shown real wisdom about guiding our people toward understanding the that this is a double-edged sword. And I think we need to be talking about it from the pulpit. We need to be modeling it in our homes. We need to be talking, especially to the younger generation who have no sense of life unplugged because they were plugged in from birth or virtually. We need to be helping them model that and valuing the things that are eternal. Uh, the relationships, the people, yeah. communion with God, that kind of thing. So um, it's not don't do technology. It, and I, I can't give you principles on how to do that. They're just, they're not there. That's what the spirit is for, to guide us in wisdom. Um, but we, I think we, we just have to be really careful that we don't get caught up in the hype. Again, we as evangelicals tend to want to be relevant. That is like our... We're like that nerdy kid in junior high who just wants to hang out with the cool kids and be taken seriously, so we, we copy everything the culture does, and they never respect us for it. You never respected that kid in junior high, did you? Right. They don't respect us. We're not going to. Let's quit trying. Um, and if the internet has taught us anything, I mean, good grief, if a hamster on a piano can get that much attention, or a bunch of guys with Mentos mints and some Diet Coke can get millions of hits on the internet, you know... What are you really proving if you become popular on the internet? That's not a badge of honor, you know. It's no offense to anybody who's got a really hot site, but you know, it is the lowest common denominator of, of the human experience to say, "Hey, I'm popular on the internet." Well, did you see what the top Google searches were of last year? Who cares if you were popular on the internet? So we have to we have to live on a completely different plane and say, "The world thinks this is important. Let me show you what's really important." And sometimes that can happen digitally. More often than it happens in Carnet. And that's what we need to be emphasizing. Yeah. You, when you're using a blog and you're using it to you know, decipher good information and relevant, do you think that it's important to um, use? I know that some of them have no pictures, others do. I don't, I don't read a lot of blogs, I don't read any blogs. But do you think that's important? Do you think that, that attracts it to it? I mean, obviously, we're not doing yeah. Twitter and all of that. We're just irrelevant information. Trying to relay something that we saw, seen, or something that's happening in the culture, and we put the spiritual 
expense to it. Well, think about this. So we want kids, we want people to come there and look at it. So do, do you, you know, is it important to have that little kind of, that's the first part, and then how, how easy it. I'll take a stab if you guys are going to I was thinking. Um, it depends. Totally depends. Um, one of the most popular websites out is the drudgereport.com. They have, it's, oh, I'll go to it, they have like, much, nothing. I mean, it's just pretty much content. And the reason why it's so popular is because the content is good for the people that they're trying to reach. So, I mean, they have pictures like this, but look at how just lame. That's a scary <laughs> But it's just text and pictures. There's no, like, art or really anything else. Oops. Okay. Anyways, um, but it, it just totally blank. And then you go to uh, somebody like um, Carlos Whitaker, who, uh, <coughs> I mean, he's like a musician, artist, blogger, like, he's got one of the, I, I think he's got one of the coolest design sites, and as soon as you go on there, you see this picture of adoption, which is one of his uh, one of his little kids, and uh, you, you go on here and automatically see a picture of his family, and you can spend about three seconds on it, you kind of get a feel for who he is without even reading his content or watching a video or listening to him. Um, so it just de depends, it depends on, on who, who you're trying to who you're trying to talk to. I think the context, yeah. Like, do you want to be just strictly the you know words, and, and that can be really powerful. I think the Drudge Report was an example. They're just an amazing, you know, they link and they're this aggregator. Or do you want to be the visual one that, like, you were kind of taking a comment. Maybe there's this picture that you want to comment on in the context of who you guys are as a church or a community. Then it can be powerful. I was thinking more in line, though, because the generation we're trying to reach is obviously that 18 to 20, so to speak. So are they, yeah. I, I assume, or we're assuming they're more apt to like things. Is that other one that you mentioned? Yeah. Like adult? I, I would definitely weigh in here that things like the Drudge Report, Craigslist, and whatnot, <coughs> they're more of a phenomenon, they're more of an exception than right. really should be the goal. Yeah. Um, I think if the Drudge Report launched right now, it would be oblivion. You know, oblivion. No one would know what it is. Because that's considered really, really bad design. Um, so I, I like the, the ragamuffin sole. That definitely indicates the design that's more appropriate for this um, 21st century. Um, so yeah, it, there, there's a ton of reading you can do on website usability and design um, that will really indicate, like, here are good things to do. Don't do big blocks of text. Use lists. There's a guy named Edward Tufty who's very good um, explaining how to get ideas across on this medium. Um, I, I definitely recommend those guys. I think it depends too, like who, again, you're communicating to. Because I know people, some people will respond very dramatically to pictures. You know, I, I, that's me. Like, I, I, I'm not much of a reader, which is bad because I'm a writer. But I'm a skimmer, <laughs> like I skim, I skim. But I can sit in, in like a Borders or something and look at photography books for hours and see a story through photography. Um, where some people are, they read and they, they respond very well to just story and just words and the pictures, you know, they can live without. Some people are more, you know, they learn audibly, so the video and having that kind of interaction. Um, and, and if you can kind of hit all of those things and what you're trying to do, you're going to you're gonna hit all of them. Yeah. It's just not to overcomplicate it either. It's like, what's the least that you can do, but still with the, with the widest breadth, I think, of, uh, of using media. Uh, it's about that time. I want to thank uh, the panel for being here and uh, sharing and with you guys. Um, also, want to let you know that uh, I think all, pretty much all you guys have to go somewhere else pretty quick to get to the next thing. So, um, if they can, I'm sure they'll email you back one time or something. I don't know. Um, but also, wanted to let you know that Faith Highway, we're, we're doing um, uh, some stuff in the back. If you guys have any questions about how we can help you with your media, if, if you feel like you need to do it, or <laughs> blogs, or <laughs> websites after this panel, you, you still feel like, man, I, I want to be on the internet. Uh, we'd love to help you out. Uh, like I said before, we're, uh, we're just glad that we could be a part of uh, NPC. and really honored that we could uh, just have this panel with you guys today. So thank you, guys. Thank you.